Well, good morning, everyone. Things don't always go to a plan, according to plan. And I'm sure that's how those who witnessed the crucifixion of their Lord felt, and felt more so when they were faced with an empty tomb. And they probably asked themselves the question, why? And why is a good question many times. In fact, um, if we'd had our technical aids with us today, there'd have been a big sign, which now is just a little sign, and it would have said, why? And what was behind that why was, why are we here? I find it helpful to ask myself the question, why in many circumstances? In my daily work, I'm forced to answer the question, why, when we investigate incidents, what caused them? I'm also forced to answer the question, why, when I'm asked to do something? Because I have to understand the why before I can a proffer an effective solution. I need to know what is to be accomplished before I can set to work and design a solution. And so today, as I stand before you, I ask myself humbly, why? Why do I come here? And would have had a little list appearing to work through. Do I come here from habit? Now I've put a tick next to that. Habit's not necessarily a bad thing. So I could come here just from habit. I might come here for social interaction. Perhaps that's not so bad either. Better than being a hermit at home. I certainly come here for encouragement and hopefully I can encourage you too. I come here for stimulation and hopefully your thoughts are stimulated today too. As someone said to me a few weeks ago, we come so that the iron sharpens the iron. I come to remember Jesus in the fullness of his life and his death. As Ian so ably caused us to consider last week our association with the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. I come here because of biblical directives. We might think of Jesus' words, do this, in remembrance of me. Or the words in Hebrews that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together and the more so as we see the day of Christ's return appearing, uh, approaching. Or to follow the example of those first believers who continued steadfastly in breaking of bread and prayers. And then there's love and fellowship, which was hinted at before with that reason of coming for social contact. I come here because I'm part of this body of believers and the greater body of Christ. And I certainly come as an expression of my faith. To draw on the faith of others, to hopefully build your faith to and to express my faith and devotion to my Lord. But all this would be nothing if it were not for the resurrection of Jesus. So as a few weeks ago, Adrian Dangerfield spoke to us about the substance, the underpinning of our faith. For me, this is the critical and the key why I'm here today the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ 
who at the Last Supper said that he would not drink of this fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Now those words would be empty words if it were not for his resurrection. So the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is key for me in my faith and why I'm here today. Probably disappointed that our reading from 1 Corinthians 15 finished at verse 19 and in a sense left us hanging. But sometimes in considering the importance of something it's useful to consider the negative as Paul did for us in those verses 13 to 19 of 1 Corinthians 15. And here comes another list. If Christ is not raised, what are the implications? Paul gives us six reasons. For me personally, he says in verse 14, my preaching's void, it's useless. It has no substance if Christ is still in the grave. Again in verse 14, my faith is void. It is of no worth if Christ is still in the grave. Verse 15, my witness and believe, I'm just a liar. There is nothing to my witnessing to Jesus because if he's in the grave, I'm a liar. We're still, point number four in verse 17, I am not saved and therefore I am still in my sins if Christ is still in the grave. And for those who've believed over the centuries, in verse 18, the dead in Christ have perished. And finally, point number six in verse 19, we're just a miserable bunch, is what he says. If Christ is still in the grave, why do we put up with people who would drag us down because of our faith and belief? Why do we discipline ourselves to a code of conduct and ethics proclaimed by our Lord and his followers? It just becomes a vapour if Christ is still in the grave. However, we know that's not the case. And we read on from verse 20. Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came resurrection from, of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive but each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards those who are Christ's at his coming. And so that is our hope. I came across an interesting little article recently dealing with this question of why is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ important? And it gave this brief answer. The resurrection of Jesus is important for several reasons. First, it is the witness to the immense power of God himself. To believe in the resurrection is to believe in God. If God exists and he created the universe and has power over it, he has power to raise the dead. If he does not have such power, he is not a God worthy of our faith and worship. Only he who created life can resurrect it after death. And only he can reverse the hideousness that is death itself. And only he can remove the sting that is death and the victory that is the graves. In resurrecting, resurrecting Jesus from the grave, 
God reminds us of his absolute sovereignty over life and death. Second point, the resurrection of Jesus is a testimony to the resurrection of human beings, which is a basic and core tenet of the Christian faith. Unlike other religions, Christianity alone possesses a founder who transcends death and who promises that his followers will do the same. Other religions were founded by men and prophets whose end was the grave. As Christians, we take comfort in the fact that Christ died for our sins and was raised on the third day. The grave could not hold him. He lives and he sits today at the right hand of God in heaven. The inspired word of God guarantees the believer's resurrection at the return of Jesus Christ to the earth. Such hope and assurance results in a great song of triumph, as Paul writes in the latter part of 1 Corinthians 15, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? So the resurrection is the triumphant and a glorious victory for every believer. Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose the third day according to the scripture and he is coming again when we know the dead in Christ will be raised to a new and glorious life. Why is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ important to salvation? It demonstrated that God accepted Jesus' sacrifice for us. It proves that God has the power to raise us from the dead. It guarantees those who believe in Christ will not remain dead, but will be resurrected to eternal life. That is our assured hope. So the resurrection of Jesus is important. As we just read, or as I just read for you, it demonstrates the power of God. It confirms our faith, it confirms my faith in the promised resurrection of believers. And it therefore is central to my faith. We might have a look at a few verses from Romans chapter 1 where we are told that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Paul introduces himself with these credentials in verse 1 being a bondservant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born a man of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. It's important, all right. And let's have a look at verses 16 and 17, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So 
we have the power of God coming to the fore, declaring his son to be his son by the power of the resurrection and then being told that the gospel is the power of God for our salvation. Oh yes, it's important all right. So what about the impact on us of the resurrection of Jesus? The impact, as the dictionary says, the effect of or influence of one person on another. So what's the impact of Jesus' resurrection? Well, let's have a look in Acts chapter 4 as we think about this. And certainly for those who were eyewitnesses of those amazing, dreadful and amazing events at the time of Jesus' death and resurrection. Shortly after that we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 33. We'll start at verse 32. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that anything he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. The impact of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ meant that those first believers were able to give witness to the things that they had learned and seen with great power. And so I too should be able to give witness to the Lord Jesus Christ with great power. They don't have to be powerful words, but they can certainly be a life and actions empowered by all that we know and the truth of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ lives today. We read a moment ago from Romans chapter 1 and verse 4 that Jesus is declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And so that has implications too. He is the Son of God, powerfully shown to be so. That then means that he is also powerfully my Saviour. Let's have a look over in 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 for a little more reinforcement. Christ and the message of God, uh, Christ and the message of the cross is the power of God. Let's have a look at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And the implication is, it's the power of God to save. And verses 23 and 24, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jew and Gentile, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So now we have power and wisdom at work in our lives. Let's go over a bit further in 1 Corinthians to chapter 13. And again, this picks up on this thought of having wisdom and power in our lives. And I have put in an incorrect 
an incorrect um, quotation there, I'm sorry. Let's try 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 4. Let's start at verse 3 for connection. 2 Corinthians 13. You seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. For though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward us. And so that has implications for the present and the future. Christ lives and therefore we live today and in the future. Peter reminds us that we have a living hope, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 3 to 5. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. Let's have a look at some more words of Paul in 2 Timothy and chapter 1. When we had got to point number six on our list of things of if Jesus is not raised, then we're just a miserable bunch of people who put up with persecution and opposition for no reason. Well, these verses are the perfect antidote to that comment. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verses 8 to 12. Therefore... Do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but has now been revealed by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, to which I, Paul, was appointed a preacher, an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Yes, we can suffer for the gospel and do so according to the power of God, assured that our actions are laid up in Christ until that day when he appears. We would remember these words from Philippians chapter 3, which again talks of suffering loss in connection with the power of God through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul says in Philippians chapter 3 from verses 7 to 11, What things were gained to me, I've counted as loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also put, count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, 
if by any means I may attain to or arrive at the resurrection from the dead. Yes, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has a massive impact on our life. Ephesians, some would say, is, apart from the great arguments of Romans, Ephesians is that wonderful, elevating book that packs such a punch. And here are some verses from Ephesians chapter 1, commencing at verse 15, that tell us that we know the hope of his calling, the greatness and working of his power, that we are made alive with Christ, we are saved by grace, we are created in Christ for good works. It's a long passage, but it's worth reading. Ephesians chapter 1, commencing at verse 15. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in that which is to come. And he's put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which once you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works and the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we're by nature children of wrath just as others but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with Christ for grace you have been by grace you have been saved and he's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the age to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Yes, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them yes the resurrection has great importance and a mighty impact on our lives and so as Paul wrote at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 in verse 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. So I come back to my little poster from the start. 
Why? Well, I've given you my testimony as to why I'm here today. What's your reason? Maybe you'd like to talk about that over lunch.